the last lesson, we installed distributed Weka and ran our first distributed Weka for Spark job that analyzed and computed a header for the hypothyroid data set. In this lesson, we'll take a closer look at how these jobs are configured, and we'll run a few more jobs that uh, use Weka classification algorithms, learned classification models on the hypothyroid data. So let's get started. Okay, here is the job that we ran last time. I've loaded it back up into the knowledge flow here. Let's take a look at how it's configured. So if I double click on the ARF header Spark job component here on the canvas, it'll bring up the configuration dialog, of which is made up of two tabs here. So the first tab is entitled Spark Configuration. And as the name suggests, there are a bunch of options here related to how the cluster is configured. Uh, so up at the top, we have uh, a couple of options that are uh, related to how Spark handles or manages memory out on the cluster. We won't go into detail about exactly how those work, but suffice to say that the defaults that are set here uh, work reasonably well for most uh, situations. Under that, there is something called the input file parameter. And that's uh, most important because the data set that we're operating on, you can see here that it's pre-configured to point to the hypothyroid data, which is in this sample data directory, which is in turn in uh, the package installation directory for a distributed Weka for Spark. Then we have the master po host parameter. This is where you can specify the address of the machine that the master Spark process is running on. In our case, we don't have a Spark cluster. We're running locally on our desktop machine. And Spark is treating each of the processing cores uh, in our CPU as a um, processing node. So that's why we have the local word specify here, specified here. And in parentheses, we have an asterisk which tells Spark that we want to make use of all of our available processing cores. If we wanted to limit the number of cores that Spark uses on our desktop machine, then we could place a number inside of those parentheses there uh, to limit that. Similarly, the master port uh, would be used if we were running against a, a cluster and uh, we needed to provide the port uh, that the, the Spark uh, master process is listening on. Further down in the list here, we can see something called the output directory. This is where uh, Weka will be saving any results generated by the job. OK, the last uh, parameter we'll take a look at here is called min input slices. With this parameter, we're telling Spark how many logical chunks to split the data set up into. So Spark will create partitions or slices of the data set and process those. And it uses one worker task uh, running on a core on the CPU of a processing node in order to process a given partition. So here we can really have some control over the level of parallelism applied to our data set. If we had a processing cluster of 25 machines where each machine had a CPU with four cores, then Spark would be working at maximum efficiency if we chose uh, 100 input slices or fewer for our data set. That way we would have the entire data set processed in one wave of tasks. Let's take a quick look at the second configuration panel in the dialog here, entitled ARF header spark job. So if we click on that, this relates to how uh, Weka will parse the CSV file, our hypothyroid data. So there are a lot of options here related to CSV parsing. So what the field separator is, uh, what the date format might be, if there are date attributes and so forth. And we can also tell Weka, since this is a headerless CSV file, what the names of the attributes are in the data. And we can do that in one of two ways, either by typing a comma separated list of attribute names in this first text box at the top here, or we can point Weka to a file on the file system that contains the names of the attributes. So we're using that option in this case by saying that there is a file called hypothyroid.names on the file system. And the format of that file is, is a simple one. It just contains one attribute name per line in the file. Well, we also have this option called uh, 
path to existing header here. So if we have already run this job and created an ARF header file and computed all our summary statistics, then there is no need for the job to run again. But we may have it as a component in an overall larger job. So in that case, we can provide the path to the file that uh, uh, the header file that was created in a previous execution, and Weka will then realize that it does not need to regenerate that file. And the last dialog box here uh, is one where we tell it what we want to call that ARF header file when it gets created. In this case, we're calling it hypo.arf. All right, now let's try running another one of the example flows that's included with the distributed Weka for Spark package. So up here in the templates menu, let's choose the Spark train and save two classifiers flow. So we'll load that one in. All right, here it is. I'll make it a little bit larger. Okay, so what do we have in this flow? Well, we have, as we can see on the left-hand side here, the ARF header Spark job again. This time, however, it is configured we take a look to make use of an existing header file if we happen to have already run this particular job on the hypothyroid data set. As we can see here this path is now filled in so we can take advantage of that existing header file that we may have already generated. And if that is the case and this exists on disk then it'll load and use this header file and then the only point of this job entry in this particular example is to load the CSV data and parse it into an internal Spark format uh, that can then be used in the downstream job entries and the rest of this flow. So that's ready to go pretty much. What we have next in the flow is uh, something called the Weka classifier Spark job. And in fact, we have two entries in this flow. So these components are executed in sequence. So uh, the ARF header Spark job will run first. When it succeeds, it triggers execution of the next component downstream in the flow. So the Weka classifier Spark job will then execute. We can see from this Spark job that uh, there is a text connection. So it will produce a textual description of the classifier that it learns, which will then be displayed in the text viewer here. That also gets saved out along with the model itself, the actual Weka model, to the file system in our output directory. And we'll take a look in there once we finish uh, looking at this flow and executing it. There's also a second Weka Spark job here on the right hand side, and this learns a different classifier. So the first one learns uh, a naive Bayes classifier, and the second one learns a JRIP rule set. And in between the two, we have another job that gets executed. This is called the randomly shuffled data Spark job. We'll discuss exactly what that's doing a little later on. Let's take a quick look at the configuration dialog for the first of these Weka classifier Spark jobs, the one that trains naive Bayes. So we open that up, make it a little larger here. What we can see is a whole bunch of settings that we can change. So we have some stuff at the top here related to telling the system what the class attribute is and what we want to call the uh, serialized model file that gets written out as the output of this job to our output directory. Down the bottom here we can see that we have an option that allows us to choose a classifier we want to run and also configure its options, just like in regular Weka. So in this case we've chosen the standard naive Bayes algorithm and you can see that we also have an option here that allows us to combine some filtering with uh, this classifier as well. So we can uh, opt to specify one of Weka's preprocessing filters here and have that applied to the data before it reaches the classifier. We can combine multiple filters if we so desire by using Weka's multi-filter filter, which is allows us to specify multiple filters to apply. All right, so there are a number of other options here. I won't uh, describe them at this point in time. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and run this flow now. So we have two classifiers that are going to be trained, naive Bayes and the JRIP rule set. So we can start this running. Before I do so, I'll get the log open so we can see the activity in the log. Uh, 
and we launch it now. All right, so it's processing away. A lot of output in the log, and now it's completed. All right, so let's take a look in the text viewer, which has picked up the textual output of these two steps, and see what we have. Show the results. That a little bit larger. Okay, so the first entry here is a, as expected, a J48, oh, sorry, a naive Bayes classifier model learned on our hyperthyroid data. So this is very similar to what you would see if you just ran standard desktop worker. And the second entry in our result list here is uh, for the JRIP classifier. Um, and it doesn't actually say JRIP here. Instead, it has something called Weka Classifier's Meta Batch, vo batch Predictor Vote. So that's a little bit interesting. We'll take a look at this output. And what we have is instead of a single rule set, we have four separate rule sets. And it's been, they've been combined into a, an ensemble learner, a vote ensemble learner, which has four separate J, uh, sets of JRIP rules as its base learners. And we can see the individual rules here in this list. So what's happened in this case? Why has it done this? Why has it learned as one why has it learned one naive Bayes model when we applied naive Bayes, but it's learned four sets of JRIP rules when we applied the JRIP classifier? To answer that question, we'll have to learn a little bit about how distributed Weka learns a classifier when it runs on Spark. But we'll leave that to the next lesson. In the meantime, you can try some different algorithms, some different classifiers in the Weka classifier Spark entries in the job we were just looking at and see what the results are on the hypothyroid data set. All right, until next time.